Hi everyone, it's Marian Owen coming to you live from Kodiak Island, Alaska. And just so you know, it's snowing outside. So I am warm and comfy inside, the wood stove's cranked up, and today we've got some fabulous topics. But first, thank you so much for being here. I hope you've got your cup of tea or coffee or beer or whatever it is. Um, we're gonna cover some really cool topics, no pun intended, because it's snowing outside. We're gonna learn for one thing, um, some new science, some new science and research about rhubarb. And that's why I'm wearing these colors. They're not normally my colors, pink and orange, but we're gonna celebrate rhubarb. I wanna start with something that I just found. It's um, a quote about gardening. And I co-authored the New York Times bestseller, Chicken Soup for the Gardener's Soul. And one of my jobs was to find quotes to go with every single story. I forgot about this one, so this was just perfect. It's by Dan Barker, and he says, People are always asking, what is the purpose of life? That's easy. Relieve suffering, create beauty, make gardens. So with that, let's dive in. We're going to have a Q&A at the end, too, so hold tight, write down your questions, and get ready to take uh, screenshots because even though I will have this up on my Gardener's Coach a YouTube channel here, you might want to take some screenshots because I'm going to share recipes and stuff like that. So, okay. So today's topics, we've got rhubarb, seedlings, primroses, and then Q&A. So rhubarb, please, is more than a pie plant. It's known as a pie plant. Rhubarb is the Rodney Dangerfield of vegetables. It gets no respect. So here are some things we're going to cover about rhubarb. And by the way, um, rhubarb is just barely coming up in our garden. A little knuckle just poking up, but it's happening. So I've got faith. So let's start with growing and dividing rhubarb. Some people say, oh, Marion, they're getting all skinny and thin. My stalks are getting really woody and fibrous and I'm not really getting much. And what I would say is it's time to split them. Now, rhubarb is a very forgiving vegetable. You can throw just about anything at it. Now, when I say you can throw just about anything at it, I'm talking about in the way of mulch with leaf mold and kelp and compost, unfinished compost, which is really important to make that differentiation because finished compost is okay, perfect to use just about anywhere, including seed starting mixes, but unfinished compost, say, is not because it can actually... Um, um, prevent a plant from growing. It might create um, seeds from not germinating, like a problem there. It can be too hot, but rhubarb, it'll take anything. And it also means, um, you know, pine needles and spruce needles and, like I said, just about anything. Last year, I had an abundance of well, it's my favorite blend to add to a compost pile. It's when you mow the lawn and you pick up the grass clippings and the leaves at the same time. I mulched probably three inches on top of the rhubarb, and I'm really glad I did because we're having a very, very cold spring. So getting back to dividing your rhubarb. <coughs> Excuse me. You know what? I'm going to have to just hang on tight, you guys. I have to get my water. Hang on. That's why they call this live, right? Yahoo! So I got my water. Important thing to realize about rhubarb, it really needs water. So if you're gonna plant a new clump of rhubarb, 
put it in a place where maybe it has partial shade or a lot of shade if you live in a warm climate. Speaking of warm climates, I used to have people contact me, or just text me from Texas. They said, hey, Marion, I want to grow rhubarb. I'll trade you with some grapefruit. So can't do it. So what you want to do is if your rhubarb stalks are getting pretty woody and they're just not producing like they used to, then it's time to divide them. And you want to do that before the stalks get too tall. And here you can see that the stalks are just starting to emerge. They're still crumpling and they haven't even opened up yet. So if your rhubarb is, say, stalks are mm, six inches tall, it's getting a little marginal. If you do have to divide it, if your friend has bribed you with, you know, like a million dollars, hey, I want some rhubarb, um, then go ahead and divide it. But just keep in mind that you don't want to, um, you don't want to harvest this year or that first year from your clumps. So you're going to divide the rhubarb with a shovel just right down the middle. It doesn't sound very pretty, but it's what you have to do. And then you want to separate it about two or three feet apart. Keep it well watered and mulched and harvest minimally or maybe not at all. So that's what you want to do is right down the middle, divide them out two or three feet and keep them well watered. Okay. Now there is also some people wonder about, well, if the, if the flower shoot pops up, should I pinch it off or not? I've done an experiment either way and it didn't seem to make any difference. Actually, I think the flower socks are kind of pretty myself. Normally, if a plant is flowering, it's telling us that it's done with a cycle. Um, if it's rhubarb, it might just be saying that maybe I'm a little stressed too. And it might be that the plant is getting older and it's just a natural thing to happen. Rhubarb is being accepted as a landscape plant. So certain stalks showing up about three or four feet with this beautiful, you know, creamy white blossoms on top. I think it's kind of pretty. So as far as nutrition goes, we kind of know this part. High fiber, it's a, it's a mild laxative, woohoo! Uh, it contains vitamin C, potassium, calcium, and so on. We know all that, but what about cooking? Rhubarb is known, of course, for the pie plant, but you can also make fruit leather, sauces, and I'm talking about sauces that are both savory and sweet. I've made rhubarb sauces that go on halibut, for example, or chicken. It's great. And how about pickles? What the heck? Yep. Rhubarb pickles. This is something I started playing with years ago because, frankly, I was kind of tired of the rhubarb pie and um, deep dish fruit rhubarb things. So I tried different pickle recipes for rhubarb, and this is the one that I found to be the most, the easiest to do. It's a refrigerator pickle, and you can use it a million ways. So here's one of those cases where you might want to take a screenshot of this. I am going to produce um, another video for my YouTube channel, The Gardener's Coach, and just cover this making rhubarb pickles and other strange things to do with rhubarb. So here you go. The rhubarb pickles, it's a, like a sweet and sour kind of um, refrigerator pickle. You want to make sure you're using a non-aluminum pan. Um, go to the bottom here. You can see how to eat pickled rhubarb. It's amazing. You can add it to coleslaws, fruit salads. Um, you can toss it with you know, like greens too. Add it to soups at the very end for that perking up. You know, I, I often will put a half a lemon in a soup, but sometimes just putting in the rhubarb is just that little tang also. Um, baked potatoes, I add them to steamed yams or sweet potatoes, even tuna salad. You can put them in sandwiches. And what another thing we do here in Alaska is we catch a lot of salmon. And if you, if you clean out the gut cavity and you want to bake it whole, say grill it or bake it, you just stuff the cavity with a blend of vegetables, even onions, and pickled rhubarb. It's awesome. 
And then when you're all done with the pickles, save that juice and use it for making salad dressings. It's a lovely pink. You can see this here and it's a great salad dressing base. All right, now I wanna talk about some discoveries that have come up in the past couple years regarding rhubarb. And let's take a look at those. For one thing, rhubarb has potential for treating Alzheimer's. And this was in the journal Aging, uh, October 21. Scientists found that rhubarb extract may help reduce the buildup of the plaques in the brain. No, why not? Give it a try. Here's the next one is rhubarb's potential use in treating skin disorders. Um, yeah, I was just looking at Barb put in there, rhubarb barbecue sauce. Hey, I want your recipe for that, please. Yeah. So um, this was something I wish I knew as a teenager about acne. And um, I, I would have given my left arm to know about this. But um, in this international journal, they found that rhubarb again help improve skin conditions like acne. So, hey, got nothing to lose, except <laughs> I was pretty darn shy as a kid. All right, a natural insecticide. Now this piqued my interest because I don't wanna use chemicals. So let's take a look. Rhubarb extract, again, has insect insecticidal properties. Now this is a natural alternative to chemicals, like I said, pesticides and so on. So they have compounds called, here we go, anthroquinones. How did I do? Anthroquinones. It's too long for Scrabble, but the point is that this compound is toxic to insects and can be used to control particularly aphids and spider mites, but aphids in particular because um, aphids are a soft-bodied insect, and so um, it probably would like get to them right away. Speaking of aphids, um, I did an experiment this year because I grow my own onions, and I have to be very, very careful that after I clip off the top of the onion and they're they're drying in the garage before I store them, I have to watch them very, very carefully because. It's pretty common for aphids to show up and they're all kind of inside the papers, but they don't really show themselves right away. So um, one thing I did was I looked at them. I said, oh no, I've got aphids showing up. I can't bring them in the house. They're gonna get all over the plants. So I took the little, the, the onion that had the little tip coming out as it was kind of drying and the aphids are right there. They're gray little guys and I actually soaked them in white vinegar for a couple of days. The whole onion, right? Aphids and all. What do you think happened? Well, at first, no aphids, they weren't moving. But I took my special 10X loop and I looked at them and I went, oh no, they're still alive. So aphids are pretty, pretty industrious, right? Okay, where are we? Got that, okay. So here is how you make a natural insecticide with rhubarb. It's, it's pretty basic, right? You can imagine you're gonna, you're gonna chop up some fresh rhubarb, put it in a pot, add a bunch of water, and you bring it to a boil, and you just reduce the heat and let it simmer for you know 30 minutes, an hour. You, know, you can always just let it simmer and then just turn off the heat, put the lid on, and then just go do errands or go weed in your garden or something. Cool it down to kind of room temp, then it's just easier to work with. Number four is you want to strain the liquid. And what I do, I do it in stages because I don't want to clog up my spray bottle. So I run it through like a, a sieve and then maybe cheesecloth to get more of the chunks. And then I actually run it through a coffee filter. And that seems to do the final trick. 
And then number five is you add about a tablespoon of, of Dr. Bronner's or some other liquid soap, not dish soap like Joy or anything like that. That's too toxic. And then you spray it um, to your plants or on your plants. If you're dealing with aphids, you want to make sure you're spraying uh, under the leaves and all over the plant. But always run a test first. Always run a test first. Wait a day or so and just see how the plant reacts, how the leaves are doing. Okay. So that's kind of a nice, besides, it's going to be a really pretty paint color, right? I'm going to um, update my video that I've got on uh, do it yourself natural pest control. So watch for that as well. Okay, I'm going to talk about seedlings here. Now, there's kind of this, how should I say, warm versus cool kind of deal. When you germinate seeds, you want to do it in a warm environment, basically. But once your seedlings have been potted up to the next size container, if that's what you do, and they're starting to grow, you don't want to have them inside your house at 70 degrees. You don't want them where it's really, really warm, unless we're talking about cool, loving plants. Remember, I'm in Kodiak, Alaska. So if you're in, in Canada, on you know Northern North America, um, etc. If if you live in Florida, this is this is a this doesn't really apply to you. But overall, you want to grow your seedlings like your broca broccoli, cabbage, uh, lettuces, um, like all your mustard greens and that kind of and your onions in a cooler environment. So that's why I said warm versus cool. And I brought this up because one of the things that I have discovered, and you probably know this, is um, these seed starting mats, these heating mats, can be pretty darn expensive. So what I use is, and I'll talk about this in the Q&A, I use these tube lights, these Christmas rope lights, and I use the non-LED, the old-fashioned ones, right? These are the ones that create or generate just a little bit of heat. And I'll show you um, the gadget that I make. It's pretty easy. And the other thing I do with these Christmas rope lights is because I'm in a cooler environment, uh, cooler climate, uh, I'm not able to grow tomatoes and cucumbers and squash outdoors. They can be covered. I can grow them in the greenhouse or the high tunnel or hoop house. But what's really important for these plants, particularly cucumbers, is they like warm feet. They like warm soil. So one thing I do with these uh, rope lights is I will actually, before planting out my seedlings, I will actually bury these non-LED rope lights in the soil about four to six inches deep. And then I just plug them in and they generate just a little bit of heat. It makes a world of difference. It really does. Besides, when you go in there in the dark, and it kind of glows a little bit. It's kind of fun. So I really like these uh, non-LED Christmas lights. If you're going to get them, buy a bunch because it's getting harder and harder to find them. So there you go. Now, warm versus cool. These ladies are cool in that they're the garden angels of Kodiak, Alaska. They just um, came over twice this week and they just worked like gardening angels in that we divided up primroses and all kinds of perennial plants in preparation of um, a fundraiser for our local public radio station. So we have a big plant sale. These are cool loving plants. And even though, like I said, it's snowing outside, they're fine. But what I want to show you is what's going on inside the greenhouse. I really wanted to show you a video I made, so just watch for the upcoming video. This is today in the greenhouse, and I want to show you a couple of things going on. So even though the temperature outside has been dropping to below freezing, and we're talking like 28 degrees and so on, Fahrenheit, these plants have been fine. And what I do is there's several things here. Number one is 
I make sure that there's always a fan running 24 seven. It's critical to have good air circulation. And that means cracking the window. You can see the window is just opened up a little bit in the back. And then where I'm standing, taking this picture, I've got the door on a latch. So that's also open. And the fan is running 24 seven, right? And then I also, um, I want to tell you this because it's not just about moving air and keeping the fungus down and everything because that comes later. But when you have moving air in your hoop house and your greenhouse, you've got seedlings in there, it actually prevents the air, the colder air from sinking down and just sitting there. We all know that um, if you're an orchardist, you know that in the lower valleys is where the cold air settles and up above at higher elevations, it's warmer. And so I just keep the air moving all the time, 24 seven. And the other thing I do is I take, um, I forgot to bring it in here. So I take a cover and I just drape it over the seedlings. And when I'm saying a cover, you can use the special fibers like the Agrabon, you can buy those commercial products. But what I've done is I've just taken, um, Things like uh, used shower curtains and sheets, of course, but those are a little heavy. They don't float very well. And I've also picked up when I go to social functions and, and, and the tables are covered with this like one, one time use tablecloths that are kind of plastic and they're just very light and fluffy. I abscond with all of those and I just drape them all over. I just reuse them. I do reuse them for 15 years. It's really great. So, all right. So that's kind of a discussion about seedlings in a cool climate. And they're much more hardy than you give them credit. And the one thing, the last thing I want to tell you about it is I don't overwater. These seedlings are in here are a little on the dry side. And the reason why they're on the, little, on the dry side, and I'll tell you a little story, is because um, years ago, when I first started gardening in Kodiak, um, I was taking Mother Earth News. And I remember reading a story by Helen and Scott Nearing. Now, these are pioneers um, that grew up in Maine and Vermont. And it was, it was all about back to the landers. That was my dream when I was growing up. I wanted an acre of land that I could just live on it, right? So Helen and Scott had a, a beautiful greenhouse they built themselves like stone walls and everything and one night they heard on the weather uh, channel or whatever they had going maybe it was just on tv we're talking like 30 40 years ago they had heard that the weather forecast said it's going to freeze hard tonight well they're going "Ooh, we've got lettuce seedlings in there we've got all kinds of things growing in the greenhouse question was what do we do should we water them like orchardists do in you know Texas and so on, if they want to protect their citrus crops, they mist them, right? Should we water them or keep them dry? So they did an experiment. One half of the crops that were in their greenhouse, they watered pretty well. They soaked the ground. Um, the plants just took up all that water and moisture and just filled all their cells. And the other half they let dry. So the next morning, they go out to the greenhouse, guess what? What'd they find? The ones that had been soaked with water, they were wilted and dead, like shriveled down to the ground. The other side that was dry was a little wilted, but as the day went on, they sprang back up to life. That was a huge lesson for me as I was learning how to garden almost 40 years ago here in Kodiak, Alaska. Now, the reason that the plants died, the ones that were soaked with water, is they just, those cells in those plants just just um, absorbed the water, expanded. And we know what happens when water freezes. It, it also expands. And so those cells lice. They just burst open like balloons, never to come back again. So that was a lesson learned. There you go. Okay. So let's dive into Primroses 101. 
primroses. Now, I'm not talking about the gaudy things that you find, the bright, gaudy, um, over-hybridized plants that you see in trays outside the grocery store. In the lower 48, we call it. I'm talking about the top-of-the-world plant primroses, or primula, which is a huge family. Um, there, there's tiny little primroses, like pixie eye primroses that are wild, all the way up to primroses that grow nearly two or three feet tall, and they're very, very fragrant. Now, what I want to cover today is in the spring, your perennials are springing back to life. And what do you do when your primrose clumps look like a donut? In this case, it kind of looks like a heart, which is kind of cool. So what do you do when your primroses look like a donut? What it means, it's telling you something, and that's that their feet are too tight in the shoes. They need space, and it's time to divide them. The center, the core, is too dense. If I was to try and put a shovel in there, which is exactly what you need to do, take a shovel, I could probably go straight down and make four clumps out of this, right? It just goes right through. It's really hard. Uh, it's just like rhubarb. And you're just going to take your shovel, your spade, and go right down the middle. And then what you do is, and I learned this from a lady, um, Marie Skomberg, who lives in a village near here. She was a world-class expert on primroses. I mean, she's no longer with us, God rest her soul. You could go online and look up Marie Skomberg, that's S-K-O-N-B-E-R-G, and you'd, you'd find references because she would... She would trade seeds with people all around the world, like the top of the world, and she would grow and cross varieties, which is much more complicated than just crossing corn or something. Anyway, she showed me how to do this. And you take your clump and you're going to put it in a tub, like a Rubbermaid tub of water. And then you're just going to let it sit there for a day or two. And then when you're ready to divide the seedlings, you're going to I'll show you a picture in a second. You're going to just tease those roots apart. You're going to just take an outer clump, an outer plant, and just tease it apart. And this is what they look like when you get them teased apart. You see, the roots are substantial. These are a drumstick variety um, primroses or primrose. And each of those are probably eight inches to 10 inches tall. And they have very, very deep roots, which is why they survive extremely severe climates and, 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 and cold weather, severe weather swings in the temperature. So that's why um, you just need to take your time, be patient. And um, if you have to use a knife, do it. And I'm just going to share one thing. It's, it's kind of personal. Anytime you're getting ready to transplant, a house plant or tease apart primroses, one thing that's very helpful is to think like a plant. I mean, how would you feel if somebody came into your house, picked you up and moved you to another house without giving you any warning? You know, you, you'd be a little disturbed. So what I like to do is I like to give plants 24 hour notice. Just give them 24 hour notice. Just say, hey, um, I'm going to divide you up and I just want to let you know so you can prepare in whatever way is appropriate for you. They are a living thing. So there you go. That's what I do. I like to do that. Okay. I wanted to show you also, are primroses edible? They're such a pretty flower, beautiful flower. And Yes, they are. This is Hot Wheels, a little bunny that was rescued by a friend of mine. Um, Hot Wheels had no use of his hind legs. And so Hot Wheels um, got a little trailer for his, his back end there so he could still paddle around and get around with his front legs. And so my friend would often bring Hot Wheels over to our house and we would just set the bunny on our grass on our lawn so he could graze to his heart's content and he would just spin these circles right he would just spin these circles around and um so hot wheels would just kind of do these little figure eights and then i learned that primroses 
are edible. And so that's what I did is I gave Hot Wheels a bouquet of primroses and he just chomped on that like nobody's business. It was the sweetest thing I ever saw. All righty. So I'm going to dive into your Q&A. Some people sent them ahead of time. If you have a question, uh, pop it in the chat. And I have some that were already given. And so we're going to dive into some of these questions. Do you need a heating mat for starting seeds? And let me kind of get rid of this little guy here. We'll hide that. And... Um, do you need a heating mat for starting seeds? No, I think that the industry has um, over promoted the need for heating mats. I don't, I don't think they're necessary at all. Uh, there are some plants that do benefit from a heating mat and that might be uh, zucchini, um, cucumber, and if you plan to start your own coffee plants from <laughs> unroasted, of course, coffee beans, then the extra, the extra heat is helpful. So a lot of tropical things. But you don't need a heating mat. If you do um, want one, they're a little expensive. They can cost you know, like 40 or $50 and they're not very big. So I wanna show you something that I did with these Christmas rope lights, right? So like I showed you before, you wanna get um, the tree lights like this, a non-LED, and they just come, you know, on a tight roll like this. And what you wanna do is, it's a pretty tight roll, so put it somewhere warm, or uh, they can even put it in warm water. Because, this is kinda of fun, this is what my husband made for me, if I can hold it up. So he took, he took just a piece of fire, styrofoam insulation and he just carved a channel, right? He just carved a channel for these things. And um, let me hook that here. Woohoo! a lot of wire hanging around here. And then he just, uh, just kind of, ran up and down, up and down. And then what I do is I just set my trays of seedlings right on top of it. And it's just, it's, it's just enough heat that it radiates up into the seedlings because our garage is pretty cool, which is what I like, generally speaking. But if I'm trying to germinate seedlings or it gets really cold, then I use that. So it's kind of fun. If you have any questions about that do-it-yourself seed starting mat, I'm going to be creating a video on that one too. But I've used this thing for like 20 years. It's great. It's great. Um, let's go to the next one. Oh, yeah. This is one that came in. This is the right time of year to talk about this. Do you really need to cut potatoes before planting? And I would say only the big ones. So if you've got a big tuber like this, go ahead and cut it up. Um, I'm not really fond of doing it because we have fairly cool soils for a while and I don't do any transplanting of my seedlings, for example, outside until the soil temperature is like 43 or so. Um, 38 is a little cool. Potatoes, same thing. If you're going to cut your potatoes, make sure you heal them over as in let them get nice and dry on that cut areas before you put them outside. If you have potatoes that have already um, sprouted, then don't break off the sprouts. Just use those sprouts and uh, plant around them. Remember, potatoes are a, a stem crop. We think of them as a root crop, but it's really all about, it's all about that stem, about that stem. Just kidding. Um, wherever that stem will have soil against it is where you're going to have your potatoes. And my favorite way of planting potatoes is not so much to cut them, but I just keep these little spuds that you know you might not really care much about or you just think oh they're too 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 small to really bother with to boil them or cook them but these are the best for planting these are um these are called drop-ins this is what the um in palmer alaska where they have an experimental farm in the interior of alaska and they study potatoes till the cows come home but 
they told me when I went to visit them and write a story about them years ago, this is what you want. You want the little drop-ins. They're kind of like a, like a sealed, like um, they're all sealed, ready to go, right? And sprouting is great. This is called chitting, C-H-I-T-T-I-N-G. So it's good to chit your potatoes before planting. So this year, save these little guys. They're wonderful. These little drop-in potatoes. This is what you want. Yep. All right. Let's see what we got. We got, oh, this is fun. What are some ways to label seedlings? We all think we're going to remember these things, right? Oh, I put this over here and I planted the cauliflower over there and, and I'm growing seedlings and I'll remember, I'll remember. Hmm. Thing is, is what gets written gets remembered. Yes. Sometimes maybe draw a chart, uh, put where you, where you plant things out, right? Put it in your journal. But I'm going to show you a couple ways that I like to label seedlings. One, of course, is the classic uh, popsicle stick. And then oftentimes I go to the local Salvation Army, which, by the way, that's where I got this sweater. Salvation Army, a dollar. What do you think? Celebrating rhubarb. But when I go to the Salvation Army, I also... I also ask and look around for Venetian blinds, right? Venetian blinds. People are throwing them away. They're broken, you know? So you don't have to cut them. You can just tear them like this, right? And they last a long time, a long time. Um, and then what I do is two things. For labeling, I use a pencil. I found that a pencil lasts a lot longer in the sun and the rain and so on than, say, a Sharpie pen, right? So I use a pencil to write on here. Or my husband, he will make these little labels, label maker, and then we just stick them right on there. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because um, we've got hundreds of seedlings started for this plant sale and doing these kind of things save me. So. Um, and those are my two favorite ways to label plants. I like to paint rocks and, you know, kind of that kind of thing once they're out in the garden. But for seedlings, when you've got like dozens or hundreds of little trays that you're giving out to people or selling to people, that's important. Um, okay. How much water do seedlings need? And how do you know, right? It is possible to overwater seedlings, especially if the bottom of the tray is full of water. And you can tell the difference between uh, a healthy set of roots and not so healthy, like too much water and just right. The plant that has healthy roots, the roots are white. When they're gray or tan or kind of brownish, they're starting to rot. So what I do to check to see if the seedlings need water, yes, I can touch the top, but I also lift up the whole little four pack or six pack. If it feels light, it needs water. I tend to keep mine on the drier side as they're growing and like I told you when I was out in the greenhouse. So I keep them slightly on the drier side so they don't get rotten. And if you do get green forming on the top, then it's okay. But it does tell you you might be overwatering. Now people say, oh no, what about damping off disease? Uh, that's not caused by potting soil that isn't sterile. That's a whole other topic, believe me. It's not by overwatering per se. And by the way, damping off is when the seedling right at the soil level just pinches and goes, and the whole seedling just goes like that, like overnight. No going back. The number one cause of damping off disease is lack of proper air circulation. So as you're growing your seedlings, Make sure, like I was saying in the greenhouse that I was talking about, make sure that you have good enough air circulation. So have your lights on a timer, or if you're, if you're growing them in your living room to germinate them, make sure there's air circulation. And that also means brushing them, you know, talking to them and brushing them. So again, lift up your little containers. If they feel light, it's time to water. When the seedlings are developed enough, then it's okay to water from the bottom. 
but for the first little while, you'll need to water them from the top and mist them. I don't miss my plants, mist my plants, spray them with water unless I have air circulation going. If I don't have any air circulation fans on and so on, I tend to not spray them with water. Okay, we got a question in the chat. What's the best way to fill up your raised garden beds here on the island? Um, is bag soil our only option? This is a really good, this is a really good question, Danielle. So let me let me talk about that because it can get very, very expensive to fill a raised bed or a big container with just store-bought potting soil. So what I do is um, let me see. Let's see here. Let's just go. I'm going to do a little demo here. We're going to pretend this is a raised bed, right? This is a raised bed. And this is brand new. And I'm just starting out. And I want to grow something this year. What I would do is I would fill it up about two thirds full or three quarters full with chunky stuff. Now, by chunky stuff, I mean could be branches, spruce branches, um, sh uh, like um, um, sawdust, wood chips, food scraps, um, kelp from the beach, leaves, like leaf duff from underneath the alders, which is fabulous. All that kind of chunky stuff. Just fill it about two thirds full. It will break down as the year goes on, but that's okay. I mean, put in newspaper any kind of organic that you can think of. Uh, bunny poop, um, um, for the island here behind the mission, there's manure mountain out in the um, rodeo grounds, there's manure mountain. So just fill it and then top it off with the good stuff. Just top it off with the good stuff at that point. If you find someone that has um, broken down manure or broken down really well rotted manure or compost that's done, then mix it in with your potting soil. Add some volcanic ash. For those of you that are listening to this and you think, volcanic ash, what's she talking about? Well, in 1912, um, Nova Rupta blew up on the peninsula and covered the island of Kodiak with two to four feet, feet of volcanic ash. It's basically silica with lots of nutrients and it's, it's like sand. It's just light colored sand, which provides some really good um, tilth air pockets and stuff for your soil. You don't want to have soil all organic. The deal is healthy soil is only five to 10% organic matter, like compost and so on. The rest is, you know, ground up rocks and it's dirt. So um, anyway, adding, adding ash or sand is really good. So there you go. That's how you would fill up your raised beds. So if you have any other questions, just throw it in the chat there. Um, oh, speaking of raised beds, I wanted to emphasize too that you can make raised beds too wide. I'm five foot three, sort of shrinking as my years go on, but and I can reach comfortably from both sides, the edges of the raised bed, that's about four feet wide. And that works for me. They can be as long as you want, but four feet wide works pretty well. You don't want to walk on your raised beds. You don't want to compact that soil. If you're putting a raised bed up against a house or up against an edge of your, your hoop house or your greenhouse, then reduce that width to maybe two and a half to three feet so you can reach in. All right. You want to be able to reach in without straining your back. Okay. Really good questions, you guys. Very, very good questions. And um, going, going, gone. Just kidding. So thank you so much for being with me today. And it's still snowing. And next time we talk next week, I hope that'll stop. But we'll have some other tips for you. If you have any questions, um, just give me a shout. And here is, did I put my email address there? Oh. What I'll do is, so write this number down, this email address. It's Marion, M-A-R-I-O-N, at gardenerscoach.com. Marion, M-A-R-I-O-N, at gardenerscoach.com. 
So thank you very much, everybody. Have a great rest of your weekend and your week, and we'll see you in the garden. Cheers. <laughs>